All right, so I'm going to explain to you. We're going to start the uh, lymphatic system. All right, write this down. Never forget it. For the most part, wherever you have arteries and veins, you have lymphatic vessels. The only part of the body that doesn't have lymphatic vessels or a lymph system is what? Right, the central nervous system doesn't have a lymphatic system. That's why the central nervous system, that environment, has to be really, really tightly controlled. We'll talk about that when we get to the nervous system. All right, here's a quiz for you. First thing in the morning. Are you ready? Okay, watch. If 10 cc's of arterial blood comes into the, through the arterial end of the capillary, how many cc's of venous blood leaves through it? Is it... Greater than 10, less than 10, or equal to 10? Mm. So if 10 cc's come into the arterial end of the capillary, how many cc's lead through the venous end? Is it greater than 10, less than 10, or equal to 10? Which one? I think it's C. You think it's C? <coughs> How many people think it's C? <laughs> I think, okay. How many think it's A? A. A. And how many? How many think it's two? Kyle, rock on. Kyle's right. Just think if you would have had extra credit, man. You could have been <coughs> ruler of the world. Sprink matter of the universe, dude. All right, watch. We learned about the four pressures, correct? Capillary fluid pressure, interstitial fluid pressure. You remember all those pressures? Okay, watch. When the arterial blood comes into the arterial end of the capillary, it's under pressure. So it's going to force fluid and small proteins out of the capillary and into the interstitial space. Do you follow this? The only way that that fluid and small proteins that has escaped the cardiovascular system can get back into the cardiovascular system is through the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system works kind of like a sewer system. It drains excess fluid and small proteins that escape the cardiovascular system and brings it back to the right heart. Say yes. Better write <coughs> this down. You've got to get this. All lymph vessels, all, 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 Lymph vessels drain their lymph into the right side of the heart. And all lymph fluid is, is filtered plasma of the blood. So lymph fluid is clear. Who's following me? Wait, what did you say that it only is? What? You said it's only, I didn't hear what you said, filtered plasma. It's filtered plasma of the blood, so it should be clear, right? Because most of it is 0.9% sodium chloride, yeah? yeah? Okay, watch. Watch. If you were to compare lymph vessels <coughs> to arteries or veins, lymph vessels are more like what? Veins or arteries? Veins. Here we go. Tell me about veins. No pressure. One-way valves. How does venous blood get back to your heart if there's no pressure? Muscle. Muscle contraction and the <laughs> thoracic pump. Yep. So muscle contraction and thoracic pump. Say yeah. And where does all venous blood get dumped into? Right atrium. Right? So lymph vessels, lymph vessels. No pressure. One-way valves. Actually, they have more one-way valves than veins. How does lymph fluid get back to your heart? Muscle contraction and thoracic pump. And where does all lymph fluid get dumped into? 
right atrium. Say yes. Tell me you got that. Watch. Watch. I got some mountain spring water here. Right? Where's the pressure of the fluid the greatest? Here or here? The bottom. The bottom. Say yeah. So capillary fluid pressure in the veins, in the venous end of the capillary, is really determined by one thing, is gravity. So because most people are upright during the day, capillary fluid pressure in your lower extremities is greater than any other place in the body. Are you following? So watch. Any time capillary fluid pressure exceeds the ability of the lymphatic system to bring it back to the right side of the heart, you get what? <coughs> you get edema. How many people follow that? So watch. If you got swollen legs, you can do one of two things. Either drain that off by cutting holes in the skin and draining that fluid out. That would be excessive putting like a little spigot on there. Or you can cause interstitial fluid pressure to try to be greater than capillary fluid pressure by compressing the tissue around it. That's why they wear head stockings. What about those pumps that they put on people? <coughs> those equity pumps? Yeah, that's mostly for venous return. Oh, okay. Because blood that doesn't move clots. Okay. Yep. So how many people wear uh, compression stockings. Nobody? Oh. Kyle? Not yet. No? <laughs> I'll give yourself a week, right? Yeah. Stand in that attention. <laughs> Say yes. You followed this. Can I tell you a real quick story? Um, I work with this guy, uh, Ray Cruz. He's a salesman. This guy could sell you your own butthole, right? He's that good. I'm not even kidding. So, anyways, he comes out. He comes out of the bathroom and he's like, "Hey, Tim, look at my leg." I'm like, "Yeah." And I said, "Is it just one leg that's swollen?" And he goes, "Yeah." And I go, "That ain't right." And then I just walk away. <laughs> I said, let me draw some blood on you. And when I drew his blood, his lymphocyte count was through the roof. He had lymphoma. Watch. You're going to learn how I figured that out. You got me? If you have congestive heart failure, typically both of your legs are swollen. But his leg was just swollen from here all the way down. Tell me you got that. The other leg was fine. <clears throat> How many people have gone on a plane? <coughs> really? Wow. Like a long plane ride to like maybe... Japan? No. Like Zion or Antioch? <laughs> no? Okay. So, <laughs> watch. It don't make no never mind where you're going. Everyone has to go through security before you get on a plane. Say yes. Watch. <coughs> this is critical. It's critical. All lymph vessels. All, oh, I'm going to write that down. All lymph vessels must filter their lymph through a lymph node before that lymph fluid gets dumped into the right side of the heart. So you think of lymph nodes as the security of your body. All lymph fluid has to be dumped through a lymph node before it gets dumped into the right side of the heart. So the function of lymph nodes really is to filter the lymph out of, of any bad stuff. Say so yeah. How do you know your lymph nodes are filtering bad stuff out of your lymph? They get swollen and tender. You have lymphadenopathy. 
Don't you think that'd be a good name for a rock group? Cheer for lymphadenopathy. No? How many people how many people followed this? <coughs> Guys? How many people got that? So watch. Where are the lymph nodes that protect your legs? Where are they? Yeah. I'm circling them. <laughs> They're in your groin. Tell me you got that. If those lymph nodes were blocked, could the lymph fluid that's trying to get back to the right <coughs> side of the heart, could that fluid get back? That's why his right leg was folded. Tell me you got that. All right. So one of the big functions of lymph nodes are to drain and filter lymph fluid before it gets dumped into the right side of the heart. Where are lymph nodes located? Almost everywhere. Do you have lymph nodes in your fingers? You got lymph, where? Those are lymph vessels. Where are the lymph nodes? Where are lymph nodes? Okay. Did you hear it on the radio today that Donald Trump is coming to Kenosha? Yeah, he's going to talk to Timmy. <laughs> we'll have a little Timmy talk. I know, I hate me too. Okay, so watch. Where are the Secret Service men when the president's walking around? Where are they? Are they right <coughs> next to them? Are they in front of them? Yeah. In back of them? Yeah. All around him. Because bad things can come from any direction. And how many people here are Catholic? Anybody? Okay. There's an 11th commandment that you didn't hear about. The 11th commandment is, Thou shalt not get bacteria into the central circulation. You got me? If you get bacteria into the central circulation, you are septic. Do you want to be septic? No, you want to go to Gateway. <laughs> that's your <laughs> that's your lifelong goal. <laughs> right? Good. It should be better at the you better write this down. So lymph nodes are in two places. Two places. One, they surround the central circulation and at openings to the body. What's your biggest opening? Right, your pie hole. Say yeah. So not only do you have lymph nodes, but you also have additional protection. You have tonsils. Say yeah. Thought that's lymphatic tissue, and that protects the oral airway. Is there bad stuff in the air? Right, pull my finger. So there are adenoids that protect your nasal airway. You've heard of these? Say yeah. Can you get your tonsils and adenoids out? Do you get infections all the time? Well, why would you take them out if you got infections all the time? Here, we'll get you this strep throat every other week. <laughs> well, my brother got him taken out, so he didn't get infections all the time. Did yeah. He um, he pro did he have giant tonsils? Yeah. Yeah. You ever seen some people's tonsils? When I ain't got nothing to do, I walk around and I say, hey, can I look at your tonsils? Yeah, some of these people got freaking giant tonsils. They look like, it looks like not good. And their airway gets very, very small, so they get sleep apnea. <coughs> and that's one of the reasons they'll take out the tonsils and the adenoids, right? And when anytime you irritate lymphatic tissue, it's going to cause inflammation. So that's why they took them out. 
So, yeah, some people are gi got giant tonsils. But watch. There's a redundancy. You can have your tonsils and adenoids removed because, watch, if you have a sore throat, you go, doctor, doctor, I got a sore throat. Doctor goes, open up and say, ah. And they're looking at your tonsils to see if they're inflamed. Then they'll do one of these numbers. Because you have lymph nodes that surround your oral airway. Say yes. And watch. Would it be appropriate for a doctor, if you had a sore throat, to do this? Would it be appropriate for them to do this? <laughs> Would it be? No. no. <laughs> right? You come in for a sore throat. Look, doctors are creepy. Did I tell you the story about the lady who went for a physical? And the, doc and the doctor said, put on a gown, take all your clothes off, put on the gown. And then when he came in, he said, okay, bend over like this and then walk backwards towards me. And he's sitting in a chair like this. And she goes, is that normal? I go, yes, if your doctor's a pervert. Uh -oh. <laughs> I go, you need to get a new doctor. And a lawyer. Can you believe that? What would even, well, we can have to do that. Sexual assault? Yeah, <laughs> to get his jollies. I, I don't know. <laughs> but you trust your doctor, right? You think, okay, there's got to be a reason. <coughs> I worked with this doctor, and he was married. He had a couple of kids, right? Church, go to church all the time. Sang in the choir at church. Then I hear on the news that he's getting arrested for um, uh, sexual assault of a 14-year-old. So she was a patient of his. And then he was writing her prescription medication <coughs> like for pain, oxy, and stuff in exchange for sexual favors. I can't believe that stuff, man. Then you wonder why I hate people. But I love this. The people who are holier than thou, right? <coughs> they go to church. They read the textbook. Those are the ones you got to watch. Anyways, tell me you filed that, guys. Okay. So where are lymph nodes, generally speaking, where are they located? No. No, we just talked about it, Kyle. <laughs> Surrounding the central circulation and and the openings to the body. That's why about 70% of your lymph nodes are located at the biggest opening of your body, and that's your GI tract. Your GI tract is a hole in your body. Tell me you got that. So that's why GI cancers are so devastating because one of the best ways for cancers to spread is through the lymphatic system. See how this is all coming together? Like a just a ridiculous novel. All right. Okay. How many people got that? All right. Here we go. The functions of the lymphatic system. We all we talked about one, right? that it drains, drains, and filters excess fluid that escapes the cardiovascular system. Yes? However, its biggest function, biggest function is involved in the immune system. What does immune mean? Why is that? Okay, so if um, you catch a case, right, and the prosecutor says you're immune, so when we try you, you're not going to get sick. If you catch a case, you're used to. What does it mean? Immune means protection. The immune system protects you. Say yes. 
And your immune system works behind the scenes. The only time you notice that your uh, immune system is when it doesn't work. There's a bacteria called pneumocystic pneumonia. It's everywhere. It's all over, especially on that door handle. <coughs> I came in today and I just looked up. I saw pneumocystic pneumonia dripping off that door handle. I wouldn't touch that thing. And the reason you don't notice that there's bacteria all over the place is because your immune system handles it behind the scenes. Do you follow this? All right. When it doesn't handle it properly or your immune system is suppressed for whatever reason, you get sick. All right. What's another word for protection? Phylaxis. Right? So if you are prophylaxis, what are you? <coughs> what are you? If you're prophylaxis, you are for protection. If you are anaphylaxis, you are without protection. You better write this down, better not pout. Anaphylaxis literally means, anaphylaxis means a total body allergic reaction. Total body allergic reaction. You've heard of anaphylactic shock? Right? You don't want that. You want to go to Gateway. It's very good. Okay, the other thing too is allergic reaction. Alright? So watch. With phylaxis, you're chilling out, relaxing, phylaxing, playing some b-ball out by the school. When a couple of guys who were up to no good started making trouble in my neighborhood. <laughs> That's like putting Neo in the Matrix. You have to do it. Do you understand? You have to do it. <coughs> Brittany, you got to do it. All right, I'm done. Okay, better write this down. What's an antigen? Nice. But that's not good enough. I know a lot of stuff that's protein, and they're not antigens. I need a better one. What's an antigen? How many people had microbiology? I mean, no. Well, there you have. You should be all over this. Who do you got for microbiology? Dr. Max. Oh, I love that guy. Yeah. Do you know he graduated from McGill University? That's the Harvard of Canada. I'm not even kidding. I tried to walk on their campus one time, and I got arrested. They don't let people like me go to McGill. That guy's a badass. I'm telling you. An antigen, better write this down, is anything, anything, anything that produces an immune response. Anything. Can a sliver be an antigen? Yeah. You get a sliver in your finger, you go, ouch. But yeah. Antigen, anything that produces an immune response. Okay, you're in microbiology. Heck, you're half, you're three quarters of the way through it. What's a pathogen? Damn, that was good. I'm gonna give you. Uh, yeah. Okay. So a pathogen is any is an antigen that can produce disease. What are the two most common pathogens that you will encounter in your studies? That's right. I'm going to tell you how I explain it. Dr. Mack probably explained it. Right? Viruses. Is that how you spell viruses? Yeah. Looks no. Why? Yeah. No. <laughs> well, you know how to spell it. <laughs> Watch. Bacteria have all the metabolic machinery they need to carry on life. They have electron transport chain, mitochondria. You, you're following me. 
they can live anywhere. They're like the 17 year old kid who says to his parents, I'm out of here, right? They can live anywhere. You got me? You've heard of a bacteria called tetanus clostridium, yes? Tetanus clostridium? It causes tetanus. It lives in the dirt. You got me? So your mom would always say, wear your shoes, don't step on a rusty nail and get locked on. I never met anyone who got locked on. No one. <laughs> Do you ever get locked on? Anybody? Big extra credit if you get it. If you get locked on before the end of the semester, <laughs> Bensie, boom. You get an automatic A. How do you get it? You, don't get extra you step on a rusty yeah. nail. <coughs> so go, like, go around like... Can you die from it? Yeah. It paralyzes your diaphragm. Yeah. What? Your name. <laughs> right. <laughs> Posthumously. <laughs> so this is what I want you to understand. Bacteria can live anywhere. You know this. You have 10 times more bacteria on the surface of your skin than you do cells in your body. And they don't bother you for the most part. Say yes. Viruses are different, or however, however I spelled it, right? <laughs> Viruses are like the 45-year-old guy who still lives in his parents' basement. They can't live on their own. <laughs> they need help. You got me? So they live down the parents' basement. They play Dungeons and Dragons and watch Game of Thrones all the time. And eat pound cake. And they get the crumbs on their t-shirt. Yup. And then they like, they eat like beefaroni, spaghettios. <coughs> and they leave the dirty dishes down in their room in the basement. Yeah. And it starts getting moldy. Okay. <coughs> Watch. Watch. Viruses need a host. The host is you. Viruses laying on tables, they will disintegrate. They'll break down in a few days. So how do you transfer viruses? Watch, this is a good time of year, right? Somebody goes, hey, two. You go, hey, I got it. And you suck it in. So one of the ways that you get viral transmission <laughs> is through droplets in the air. Or somebody says, hey, it's nice to meet you. Right, so you pick your nose and then you shake somebody's hand. <laughs> Tell me you got that, right? So viruses need a host and there usually has to be direct transmission of that virus or something that allows that virus to tra uh, travel from one person <laughs> to the other. Now, and I'm not gonna go into it because you had microbiology. Watch, viruses, how they work, all viruses are, if, it's a, if the virus contains DNA, it's a regular virus. If the virus contains RNA, it's a retrovirus. You got me? Wait, if, it DNA, if it contains DNA, it's like a normal virus. If it contains RNA, it's a retrovirus. So if under a microscope you look at retroviruses, yep, they got that felt hat with the feather and the big wide silk, a uh, silk shirt with a big lapel. Retro. And they, if you look really close, they'll pop a lock. <laughs> pop a lock. <laughs> pop a lock. <laughs> they, uh, <coughs> I saw Michael Jackson on Soul Train when he was still with the Jackson Five doing the robot. That was like way, that was like in the seventies, and then the moonwalk he did too, from the seventies. Guy was a great entertainer. He was looking up your old address. Mm -hmm. Okay, are, are you following this? All right, so watch. Well, let me just tell you one more thing about viruses. Watch. Viruses, because they don't have the same metabolic machinery, right? They need to take hostage your cells. So what they will do is they will take, if you have hepatitis, they will take your liver cells hostage and say, liver cells, you don't liver anymore. 
all you become is a viral production factory for hepatitis B viruses. Do you understand that? That's why people go into liver failure if that hepatitis B virus begins to spread. Did you follow that? Okay. That's good. All right. What are the bloodborne pathogens? Come on. My name is Bloodborne. How'd you know? You saw the H, huh? Filled in the blank. Hepatitis B, C, D. Now they got a new one. E. If they discover a new one, what do you think they'll name it? Ken. <laughs> Good. Good answer. Yeah, hepatitis A <coughs> is different. Hepatitis A is not bloodborne. Watch. After class, you go to Jimmy John's, and the dude makes your sandwich freaky fast, and this is exactly how it happens, right? He's making your sandwich freaky fast, and then he goes like this. I gotta go. So he runs into the bathroom, and he drops a deucer real quick, and he don't wash his hands so good, then he comes back and he wipes a little bit of turd on your sandwich, right? But that turd is infected with hepatitis A. Then you bite into the crap sandwich, now you've got hepatitis A. So hepatitis A is transferred fecal oral. That's why, but you go to bars and restaurants, all employees wash hands thoroughly before returning to work. They could care less that you bite into a crap sandwich. <laughs> they just don't want that sandwich, that crap sandwich, tainted with hepatitis A. It's bad for business. That's why they do that. Isn't that lovely? On a side note. You painted a really great picture there. Nobody's ever going to eat at Jimmy John's again. <laughs> Watch. There were two students like three or four years ago. They sat right there. They would order Jimmy John's every Thursday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then the dude would knock on the door. And I'm like, what is this? In class. Yeah. And you come in and they'd pay for it. That's why I use Jimmy John's. So when I went over this, and they're like. Did they order Jimmy John's? They didn't order Jimmy John's anymore. See how that works? Watch, on a side note. You gotta be a real brain donor to do one of two things or both. Piss off a cop or your waitress or waiter, right? You never piss off a waiter or waitress while they're serving you. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. You don't do that. And you don't piss off a cop when they pull you over. Do you understand? They have you. And I see this all the time. I'm like, well, who cares? Remember what my buddy said. I used to get upset about stupid people. He goes, Tim, don't get upset. Take advantage of it. <coughs> mm -hmm. How many people followed this so far? Guys? Okay. All right. If you get this right, you will be officially legends. How does the immune system protect you? <coughs> no type bodies. <laughs> What's that? Very basic. That's too long to write out. <laughs> Come on, I well, look. I don't know, but just guess a frickin' letter. A. 
Wait, I ain't done with the A's. Oh. <laughs> e? What is it? See, you had a girl. She played it right. <laughs> Wait, how do you spell inflammation? Love. T. I. Oh, I did it right. Yay. Inflammation. Better write this down. <clears throat> the primary function of the immune system and how it initially protects you is by producing inflammation. Say yes. Watch. You leave today and somebody throws a textbook at you and hits you in the arm. What happens to your arm? It hurts. It hurts. And what else happens? And what else happens before it gets bruised? It gets red and hot and swollen. That's inflammation. Say yes. Okay. Ready? Here we go. Watch it. Who's watching? <clears throat> the cells of the immune system, and for that matter, blood cells, are primarily produced in the bone marrow. They're also produced in the spleen. So the spleen is also an organ involved in the immune system. Now watch. All blood cells, red blood cells, whatever, white blood cells, all start out as hematopoietic stem cells, right? And then those stem cells will then begin to differentiate into different types of blood cells. So when you talk about the formed elements of the blood, this is what you need to know. The formed elements of the blood are <coughs> red blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells, leukocytes. Who's following this? Watch. Our red blood cells, is their job basically the same? Is there, do red blood cells, all red blood cells do the same things? Right, they carry oxygen and carbon dioxide, right? So is the shape of a red blood cell, should it be different than other red blood cells? No, because their function is basically the same. Are you only exposed to one thing? No, you're exposed to many different things. That's why there are different white blood cells. What are you eating there? Fritos. What kind? Just regular Fritos? Those are good. You know what I had for supper last night? Urine? Urine? <laughs> Beer. Oh, that's a staple. That's like that every day. <laughs> are you going to guess or no? What? I, so, I think somebody said it. Robin? No. No. Oh. I had a hot pocket. <laughs> that uh, cheese and ham and uh, uh, broccoli. If those things are hot enough, you can eat them. You can choke those things down. And watch. The ham and cheese ones are good. Yeah. I like the broccoli, though. <coughs> All right? Who cares? Are you ready, guys? So the white blood cells are different. Say yeah. And these, you better remember this, these are the white blood cells. 
Do you remember them? Yeah. Do you remember your our little uh, little thing? I guess not. This is the order in which you go from most numerous white blood cell to least numerous. And how you remember it is never let monkeys eat bananas. So the different types of white blood cells are neutrophils. They're the most numerous. Then you have the lymphocytes. I'll explain more about that. Then you have monocytes. Then you have eosinophils. And then you have basophils. So most numerous to least numerous. All right? How many people are following this? Now watch. If you're born with something, it's what? It's referred to as what? <coughs> Innate. You better watch it. You are born with these guys right here. These guys right here you're born with, and they're ready to kill. They're like the sons of anarchy. They'll kill anything. Guys, so this is part of your innate immunity. And these guys, it don't make no never mind what you are. It's going to attack it and destroy it. And the first guys to always arrive on the scene, first guys are the most numerous. So neutrophils are the first white blood cells to arrive on the scene of, a, um, of an infection. And what color are white blood cells? They're white. Looks very good. So when you have a collection of white blood cells, you have pus. Tell me you got that. All right. Okay. So this is what I've, these guys right here, these guys right here, I refer to as kind of like the traffic cops. Right? The, tr these traffic cops are driving around looking for bad guys. You follow? And when they find a bad guy, they will attack it and destroy it. Who's following this? The lymphocytes are different. The lymphocytes have to be programmed. So these guys, the lymphocytes, are like the terminators. And Kyle never saw a terminator. Right? Did you see terminator? Uh, that's a okay. That's okay. Now watch. In terminator, who was the terminator programmed to kill? Sarah Connor. Right? So what did he do? He went, he let his fingers do the walking. He went to the yellow pages, right? And he found all the Sarah Connors, ripped it out, went to their house and killed them. And he knew that if he killed all the Sarah Connors, he would kill the one that he had to kill. Do you follow that? <laughs> That's pretty smart for a machine. Now, if they would have just left him alone, <coughs> that movie could have been over in like 15 minutes. But people started bothering him. Right? So he had to kill people and he didn't want to kill them. He just wanted to kill Sarah Connor and then get back and, you know, terminate something else. You better get this. These lymphocytes have to be programmed to kill. And when they are programmed, they kill one and only one thing. Do you follow this? How do you program them? <coughs> By being exposed to something. So watch. When you have a little baby, oh yeah, oh yeah. What do the parents do? They call the dudes in the white suits, and then they come in and they completely disinfect the house, right? So they bring Egbert home, right? And they're like, ah, here, here, here's a Twinkie. Then they got to go back to work. So they put him in daycare. 
the booger infested, right? You can't swing a dead cat without getting sick place. So the kid is sick for the first nine months out of his life because he is being exposed to stuff for the first time. Tell me you got that, right? So the only way that you can program lymphocytes is by being exposed to something. Now, with that in mind, with that in mind, scientists have taken advantage of that and they can actually <coughs> inject into you the stuff that causes a particular illness but it doesn't make you sick. Those are the vaccines. Do you follow this? All right, so <coughs> there are three types of lymphocytes, T cells, B cells, and NK cells. NK cells have the best name for a cell ever. They're called natural killer cells. These guys are badasses. They don't even ha have tattoos. When they kill you, they put their tattoo on you. And they're pretty good. I saw some stick people that are really kind of outstanding. Natural killer cells, they're involved in destroying your own bad cells. Do you make bad cells? Do you? Well, I do, look at me. I'm a mess. No, no. Natural, natural uh, killer cells. Well, yeah. Killer T cells are a form of natural killer cells. So watch, watch. Natural killer cells, they go around your body and they look for your own cells that ain't working good. Tell me you got that. So if you're making jacked up cells, the job of the natural killer cell is to attack it and destroy it. Say yes. Are cancer cells abnormal? Why don't natural killer cells attack them and destroy the cancer cells? Because the cancer cells divide too fast for the natural killer cells to keep up. So watch, real smart people with tape and a pocket protector, they figured out how to alter the DNA of natural killer cells so that they will be able to identify cancer cells quicker and destroy them before they begin to spread. That's in your lifetime. So the cure, the cure for cancer will be a vaccine. So you can get vaccinated against cancer. Isn't that nice? That means you'll live a long time and have to work longer. I'll be dead by Tuesday. I'll get it by Exactly how you're thinking. Too. I get it. I mean, I get it. You know, like I told you this, right? If I leave from here and I go home, right, and I'm killed in a fiery car crash, the dean will come in and, on Friday and say, Tim was killed in a fiery car crash. You know what you'll do? Who's going to teach class now? <laughs> do we got to take the quiz on Tuesday? <laughs> yeah. And then that Friday, you'll bring in some dishes, you know. You have some maybe lasagna and a fruit salad. Mm -hmm. Say yeah, you got me. All right, so let me explain. <clears throat> Are you with me? I'm going to explain to you now the process of inflammation. I want this whole thing. You ready? Before we begin, there has to be some terms that you need to understand. Floating, write this down, I'm not. Floating around in your blood and in every tissue of your body. Every organ, every <coughs> tissue of your body. You have these cells called mast cells. What do mast cells contain? Yeah. 
That's perfectly logical. But no. Mass, you better write this down. Mast cells contain a chemical called histamine. Have you heard of histamine? You've probably heard of antihistamine, right? You've heard of that? Histamine is a chemical that's released from mast cells. Do mast cells have a cell membrane? Sure, that's why they're called mast cells. Okay, and where's the histamine? It's located inside the mast cell. Are you following that? Guys, as long as that mast cell membrane is intact, the histamines remain inside the mast cell. Who, who's following that? But watch it. Through trauma, tissue trauma, that's a trauma. Hmm. Mast cells can <coughs> rupture, and when mast cells rupture, what do they release? Histamine. You got me? Got to write this down. <coughs> Histamines do two important things. Number one, they cause massive arterial vasodilation in the area that they were released. Massive arterial vasodilation in the area that they were released. And number two, histamines cause increased capillary leakiness. The capillaries become leaky. To everything. Mostly the fluid. The formed elements are too big to get whole, uh, through those little holes. Are you following this so far? All right, I'm going to show you a video. Love this video. Eh. Ready? Who's ready? The inflammatory response. The inflammatory response. At least got a pretty good voice. She's pretty good. Oh, there's the epic man. Okay, are you ready? Okay. These little guys right here are mast cells. What do mast cells contain? Histamine. Histamine, right? As long as that mast cell membrane is intact. The histamines remain inside that mast cell. But watch. If somebody doesn't like you and they take a broom handle and they stab you. Is an important non-specific okay. Bam. A broken broom handle right there and they stab you. Look at that. Ouch. Do you damage tissue? Yeah. When you damage tissue, you rupture mast cells. Are you following this? And when you rupture mast cells, what's released? Histamine. What does histamine do to the arteries and arterioles that are supplying that damaged area? They dilate them. So where does arterial blood always go? The path of least resistance. So when the little left ventricle contracts, where's that warm red blood going to go to the damaged area and that area becomes red and warm if you get this this is high level thinking what i'm about to ask right now if you get it it'll be very good where are white blood cells. I'm going to give you a hint. Blood. 
in the blood. Very good, Cal. You came right out and you processed that very quickly. White, white blood cells are in the blood. Tell me you got that. What do white blood cells do? They attack what? Antigens and pathogens. Say yes. So if somebody stabs you with a broomstick, you've broken the skin. The best barrier you have to infection is intact skin. You've unintacted it now. So what can potentially get into your bloodstream? Bacteria. Do you want that? No. How many people are following this so far? So with the damage to the tissue and the rupture of the mast cells and the release of histamine, the, you're going to get arterial vasodilation in that damaged area. Where are the white blood cells? They're in the blood. Where do you want the vast majority of your white blood cells to go if you've unintacted the skin and bacteria can potentially get in there? You want them to go to the, that point. How do they get there? <coughs> By histamines causing the arterial vasodilation, that arterial blood is going to take the path of least resistance and it's going to cause the white blood cells to start going to that area. Do you follow that? These right here are tic tacs, green tic tacs. These are bacteria. Guys, who's following this? So the histamines cause massive arterial vasodilation in the area of the damaged tissue. And they cause increased capillary leakiness. Watch, I have to move advanced. Okay, watch. Histamines get released, and now the capillaries become leaky. Because the capillary wall becomes leaky, what's going to leak out? Right? Plasma. You got me? Who's with me? So that plasma will start leaking out, so that area will become red, warm, and swollen. Now, write this down. Write it down, for real. Who's writing it down? This is a blood vessel. Just so you know, the formed elements of the blood white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, they flow in the inner portion of the artery and arterial. Are you with me? Yeah. They flow in the middle of the artery or arterial. That's called laminar blood flow. <clears throat> Where do you want, in this case, the white blood cells to go? You want it to get out of the capillary so it can attack and destroy those green tic tacs. Say yes. So when the histamines are released, it's going to cause the capillaries to open up and plasma will begin to leak into the interstitial space. As plasma is removed from the interstitial or into the interstitial space from the blood, the white blood cells will be able to come closer to the capillary wall. Who's following this? And white blood cells have a unique feature found in no other cell of the body. These white blood cells have the ability to squeeze through these small pores and get into the interstitial space. That ability of the white blood cells to actually move is called diapodesis. <coughs> you got me? They can actually move. Right? Diapodesis, that would be a good name for a rock group too. It's here for diapodesis. And their new hit, slow motion. I like it like that. It's working that. Here we go. Uh, ready? Oops. How's that? Okay, ready? Watch.
plasma is leaking out, area becomes swollen. White blood cells, diapodes, squeeze through those little pores. If you get this right, I'm going to be proud of you. And then they eat. Nom, 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 nom. Nom, 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 nom. Watch. How do white blood cells know that those are bacteria? How do, why don't they recognize it? Why don't white blood cells attack your cells and kill them? Your cells have a big group of proteins called the major histocompatibility complex. The major histocompatibility complex allows your immune system to identify your own cells. What don't these bacteria have on their cell wall? The major histocompatibility complex. <coughs> if you say major histocompatibility complex to Terry the custodian, he'll give you money. Christmas is coming up, so I'm gonna have the word of the day. So before the semester ends, I'm giving Terry 50 bucks. If you see Terry and you say the word of the day, He'll give you 50 bucks. I'm not even kidding. Right? And that could be a difference maker, man. Right? You could buy you could buy me something real nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that 50 bucks has to be spent on me, Timmy. How many people followed this, guys? Yes or no? All right, now watch. It gets better. This is the first phase of inflammation. What's it primarily caused by? It's primarily caused by the rupturing of mast cells and the release of this histamine. Guys, all right, watch. I'm gonna say it real slow so you can get this and write it down. When white blood cells come in contact with a pathogen, What's the first white blood cell to come on the scene? A neutrophil. The neutrophil, when it comes in contact with a pathogen, it begins to release chemicals. Those chemicals are called chemoattractants. And these chemoattractants that are released, they're like little breadcrumbs. They give other white blood cells a little trail to find, uh, follow to go to the location of that infection. Who's following this so far? All right, watch. The chemoattractant <coughs> that's released by white blood cells that's very important for you to know is this dude right here called prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are synthesized by white blood cells in response to an infection and or tissue damage. Who's with me so far? Prostaglandins do several things. A, they stimulate no see receptors. What does no see mean? It means you should really stay out of people's business. You're so nosy. That's a pun. Noxious is painful. Prostaglandins stimulate 
nerve pain fibers in the damaged area. Why do you want pain? Huh? Why do you want pain? Right, to activate the sympathetic nervous system and pain tells you something's wrong. When the doctor says, the patient says, Doc, it hurts when I do that, and the doctor says, don't do that, that's a good advice. So pain tells you that there's something wrong. And pain can localize, be localized so you know where the damaged area is. Say yes. Guys, please, tell me you're following this. That's number one. Number B. It amplifies the inflammatory process. So it makes the inf inflammation worse. And one of the functions of inflammation is to potentially wall off any microorganism from getting into the blood and into the central circulation. And then number C, it produces fever. Who's following this? Guys? Watch. What produces prostaglandins? What produces prostaglandins? White blood, cells. White blood cells, specifically neutrophils, right? Why are prostaglandins released? Stimulate pain receptors, right? So you know the area that is damaged. It amplifies inflammation to further protect you and wall off any potential infection from spreading. And it produces a fever. I'll explain that in a little bit. <coughs> Say yes. You're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. Yes, it walls it off. Did I spell ibuprofen right? Good. What? I didn't? Is it? Okay. Who cares? Watch. Watch. Ibuprofen inhibits the synthesis of prostaglandins by white blood cells. Ibuprofen inhibits the synthesis of prostaglandins by white blood cells. <clears throat> if you inhibit the synthesis of prostaglandins by white blood cells, it can be, it can reduce pain. It can reduce <coughs> inflammation and it can reduce fever. That's why ibuprofen can be used as an analgesic, an anti-inflammatory, and an antipyretic. For the crowd, you see how beautiful that is? How many people here have little babies? Oh man, oh man. Nobody has little babies? Nobody? Bunch of big babies. Bunch of big babies? <laughs> when they have fever, what does the doctor tell you to do? Nothing. <laughs> to alternate ibuprofen and Tylenol every four to six hours. Ain't that right? Watch it. <clears throat> Watch it. Look at that. That's a mess. <laughs> Here we go. Look. This is going to be good. You're going to learn something, maybe. I don't know.
What's this? Good. Don't you wish that was on every test? <coughs> okay. What's this? Yep. You're not going to believe this. This is so sickening. I'm going to vomit bow right now. You have prostaglandin receptors on your H cell. What does the H cell control? What's normal body temperature? You got prostaglandin circulating. When prostaglandins bind to prostaglandin receptors on the hypothalamus, it's going to say to the hypothalamus, hey, buddy. It'll actually say, hey, buddy. Reset that temperature to 103. Is a fever good for you or bad for you? It's good and bad. I'm so confused right now. It's so confused. Fever good for you or bad for you? It's good. What's the goal of the body? Fever good for you, bad for you. The body does stuff that makes sense, though. So if you're getting a fever, is it good for you? Yes, it is. You better write this down. And you learned this in microbiology. You did. Remember when you streaked a plate? And then you had to incubate that plate at 37 degrees Celsius, what, 45 and some, something else? At 37 degrees, the bacteria grew the best, didn't they? Higher temperatures make bacteria grow slower. Higher temperatures make bacteria grow slower. And watch, white blood cells, even though this is yellow, work better at higher temperatures. So white blood cells, num, 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 better, and bacteria <coughs> grow slower. So is a fever good for you or bad for you? Good. It's good for you. However, watch it, a prolonged protracted fever, is that bad for you? Yes, that's why the doctor says, alternate ibuprofen and Tylenol every four to six hours. What's that? Tylenol does do something. Tylenol prevents the synthesis of prostaglandins by the brain. So can Tylenol be used as an uh, anti-inflammatory? Where does, what causes exaggerated inflammation? Prostaglandins re produced by white blood cells. So can I be, I, Tylenol <coughs> affect the synthesis of prostaglandins by white blood cells? It will only affect the synthesis of prostaglandins in the brain. So it can be used as an analgesic and an antipyretic, but not as an anti-inflammatory. And what you're worried about is controlling the fever. And because the mechanism of action is different, that's why you can alternate it. And you want the baby's temperature to go up, but you don't want it to stay up. You want to bring it back down so that they don't get their enzymes jacked up. Yes or no? Do you see where the, how I brought that together? That's incredible. I'm having a swig of coffee. Anybody want to drink off my coffee? That was very quick, that and response. Just babies and not like kids and things? No, same thing. Same thing, why? No, just because my doctor usually is like, just leave it alone if they're fine. If they can yeah. And that's what I do too. I'll yeah, just leave if it. they're babies, the thing is their body, their body is so small that they can't dissipate the heat. <coughs> right. So you, normally, yeah, just leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Tell me you got that. 
Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. And technically, isn't a fever like 100 and it's like way higher than most people think, right? What's that? Like a, a fever, the temperature of a fever. Because I have, you know, all their mom friends that are like, the temperature is 100. They're, they have a fever all the time. It's like really, it's higher than, much higher than that. A lot right? higher yeah, than like that. Like 103 or something. Or right. Something. If they got like 104.5 <laughs> or something like that, then that that's that's concerning. A yeah. fever of 100. Mo mm -hmm. I'm telling you. Moms. You know what? These helicopter parents, man, <laughs> they need to crash. They're making life difficult. No, I'm serious. All the time. My mom friends all the time. I can't, my kid can't go to school. I have a 99. <laughs> they what? I work in the walking clinics. You see that all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, they do have the fever. Uh huh. I know. I have a friend of mine that texts me all the time. She's a little bit of a hypochondriac. She her fever. My daughter's fever is like, it's a hundred. It's been like a hundred point three. I'm like, that's fine. <laughs> You know what's weird? It's all the information that's out there, people are dumber. Like, how did I make it? Like, how did I make it as a kid? Like, what did my mom do that allowed me to be alive now? I must have had a fever at some point. There's a question on the final. Explain how ibuprofen and Tylenol work to reduce fever. I just explained that to you. <coughs> Remember that Tylenol works by preventing prostaglandin synthesis in the brain. So it can be an analgesic because where do you sense pain? Where do you perceive pain? In your brain, right? So if you, um, so it can be an anti, uh, our analgesic and an antipyretic, but it's not an anti-inflammatory because it acts centrally. Do you follow that? In that nursing test, they love asking that question. Love it. I can't remember now what it was for, but after I had one of my kids, I had an anesthesiologist come in and tell me something about Tylenol doesn't really work well for something or another like the over-the-counter stuff because she gave me something but it was injected like she said it works better for some reason than the stuff that you get at the store is crap oh really yeah well i don't know yeah i just don't take it i just drink to numb my pain <coughs> That's crazy. or rub some dirt on it like if your arm was hurting coach would tell me rub some dirt on it and i rub some dirt on it and it actually would help just so you know, listen up, because how many people have, like, kids, right? How many parents actually kiss their kids' boo-boos? Like fake ones. Like their imaginary boo-boos. No, if, like, blood is spurtling, you know, you don't go down and bend down and kiss it. Watch. Kissing a kid's boo-boo actually makes it better. Do you understand? It actually does. Because, watch, you cannot experience pain and pleasure at the same time. What happens when you hit your elbow? What do you, what's the first thing you do besides swear? And you begin to massage it. Massage is pleasurable. Pain and pleasure go through the same gate in the spinal cord. So by rubbing it, it actually reduces the pain. And if a kid believes that if their mother kisses their boo-boo and makes it better, it does. Because your brain will actually reduce endorphins and encephalins, these natural painkillers, where it will feel better. Okay, yeah. So I need videos of you kissing kids' boo boos. Just a random kid on the street. Skins his knee. Here, let me kiss it. I'll get extra credit. I'm going to pay our bail money too. <laughs> Tell me you got that. In the brain. Yeah, that brain. How many people got this? All right, so I'm going to teach you some practical applications of what you just learned. Are you ready? Watch. 
let's say, for example, through, uh, you know, <clears throat> I don't know, um, through the grace of God, right, you make it through the gateway program and you become a nurse and you work in an emergency room. Got me? And a patient calls and says, I twisted my ankle. Do I put ice on it or heat on it? What are you going to tell them? Why? Yeah, that's uh, but you you just stopped and needed more. What Kyle was hoping is that if he said enough big words, he would. <laughs> that's actually good. You didn't put it together, but I'm I'm proud of you for trying. Now watch. Watch. This is a cell. This is a cell. This one is bigger than this one. Did you see that? You don't even care, do you? These are damaged cells. Are you following this? In order to repair tissue, you have to remove the damaged cells and then your body will replace those damaged cells. How many people are following this? Now watch. <coughs> what chemical is released to attract more cells of the immune system? Prostaglandins. So watch. Please write, I'm gonna say this really slow. Prostaglandins are stored inside your cells. Prostaglandins are stored inside your cells. If the cell is healthy and intact, where are the prostaglandins? Inside, inside the cell. But if you twist your ankle, because you were carrying the textbook, you rupture cells. And where do the prostaglandins go? Right, right, they will come out of the cell. What do prostaglandins do? They increase inflammation, and when you damage tissue, you rupture mast cells. So that area is gonna become red, warm, and swollen. Say yes. What's in the blood? White blood cells. The white blood cells will then squeeze through the little spaces created by the histamine and they respond to prostaglandins. And anything that's attached to prostaglandins, they're going to attack and destroy, clean up. Say yes. This is the one thing you had to learn in chemistry. You had to learn this. <coughs> what does heat do to the rate of diffusion? You got me? So watch. When those damaged cells release prostaglandins, if it is warm in that area, those prostaglandins can actually diffuse out to the surrounding healthy tissue and bind to healthy cell membranes. Your white blood cells don't know that's a healthy cell. All it sees is prostaglandins attached to this area, and its job is to attack and destroy it. Do you want your white blood cells to attack and destroy healthy cells? No, because it takes longer for you to recover. So when you damage your own cells, you always put what on it initially? Ice, because what does ice do to the rate of diffusion? It slows, down. slows it down. So when the white blood cells do come to that area, they are just going to attack and destroy the tissue, the cells that were damaged. And healing takes less time. So there's a rule of thumb. If you damage your own cells, it's ice for the first 24 to 48 hours. 
say yes. If you have an infection, what do you put on it? Do you put ice or heat? Why? And don't say to draw out the infection. You put heat if you have an infection. What does heat do to arteries? Where are white blood cells? So if you apply heat to that area and heat causes arteries to dilate, where do more white blood cells go? To that area. And they kill it. Did you follow that? You know who will explain that to you? You think I'm lying? Do you have any idea how good that information was right there? That is top flight. And nurses love talking about inflammation. They sit in the break room, all they talk, inflammation, inflammation. Everything's inflammation. I people. Right, if you put ice on it, ice prevents those prostaglandins from diffusing to the surrounding healthy tissue, right? And you don't want that. Right? Because you want you don't want to destroy healthy cells, right? It doesn't make sense. It takes longer to heal. So by applying ice that reduces the rate of diffusion and you, the immune system only cleans up the damaged cells. Did that make sense? That made perfect sense. Okay. Plus, by reducing inflammation, you also reduce the spread of prostaglandins, which will cause the um, pain to be less. Right? So if you damage your ankle, have somebody rub it. Let me rub my ankle here. It hurts. There's a group of people, I think they're in, uh, I think they live in Mount Pleasant. Uh, they have a genetic uh, condition called congenital indifference to pain. They cannot feel pain. So the five-year-old kid walked around for a year and a half on a broken ankle. Because they didn't know, the kid didn't know it was broken because they can't feel pain. That'd be cool, man. You could work like in a carnival or something. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, hit my hand with a hammer. Go ahead, I dare you. Right? Here, run me over with a truck. Anyway, there's a group, I, I don't know, it's like Scandinavia or something like that. How many people followed this? For real? Okay. All right, watch. How do you know an infection is really bad? I'll give you that, but how do you know your infection is pretty bad? How do you know that? What else? You get lymph node involvement. You got me? So watch. That's a foot. What do you think of that foot? Not much, huh? Yeah, it is. That's an artery and that's a vein. You're not really, really big on the, on the, <coughs> the drawing here. Okay. What's that? Yeah. Do you notice how I made it appear to go under the capillary? You're not even at all excited about that at all. Okay. All right, watch. What's the first guys to arrive on a scene? Right. 
So watch. Let's see. Make it. What's this? That's a nail. You stepped on it. Ouch. Know this. Listen up because this is true. The most infective injuries are puncture wounds. Because puncture wounds don't bleed. And bleeding your own blood actually washes out bacteria. Do you follow that? That's why bites of any kind are always infective. They're very infectious. Tell me you got that. So if you step on a nail, you've unintacted the skin who's following this. And now you've got bacteria in there. <coughs> Who's with me? White blood cells will go to that area. Why? Due to the release of histamines, right? That area is going to dilate and the capillary is going to become leaky. Who's following this? So watch. So you got a white blood cell. And that white blood cell is going to squeeze through that area and it's going to go num, 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 num. Say yeah. And what the white blood cell does, if you're getting your butts kicked, that white blood cell takes the bacteria, eats it, and then takes some of the proteins and puts it on the surface of that white blood cell. Are you following me? And that white blood cell that ate that bacteria and then popped on some of the proteins on the surface of that bacteria, <coughs> that white blood cell gets into the nearest lymph node and then travels, I'm, I'm sorry, the nearest lymph vessel and travels to the nearest lymph node. Who, who's following this? So in this case, where would be the nearest lymph node if you got your stepped on attack in your your inguinal lymph nodes, right? So this is what would happen. You have this white blood cell, which will now be red, right? And it ate the bacteria and it put the proteins on the surface. And it will say to the lymph node, look, dude, we're getting our butts kicked down there. Can you help a brother out? Right? And then the lymph node will begin to produce specific lymphocytes, T cells and B cells, to attack and destroy that thing. Where do all lymph nodes or all lymph vessels dump their lymph node, a lymph fluid, into the right atrium. So those newly formed lymphocytes are going to leave the lymph node and then go into the right atrium. Lungs, left atrium, left ventricle, left ventricle contracts, and because you had prostaglandins and histamines released, where do those newly formed lymphocytes end up? in that area. So one of the reasons that doctors will prescribe antibiotics is if there is lymph node involvement. If there is lymph node involvement, then the doctor knows that this is a pretty serious infection and you may need a little help. Say yeah. That's why a doctor will always ask, how long have the symptoms been going on? So if you don't have any lymph node involvement, you may have just gotten sick. <coughs> That's why they may prescribe antibiotics prophylactically. But if this has been going on for a week and there's no lymph node involvement, then the doctor knows, hey, your immune system's doing okay, right? The local cops are taking care of it. You don't need to call in the SWAT team. Tell me you got that. Yes or no? Okay. So don't step on a nail. Is anybody willing to do that for extra credit? No? Would anybody willing to, to volunteer to be a cadaver at Gateway? No? Okay. 
you guys are just all right let me show you something write this down write this down who's writing it down anybody Look at this, the immune response and anaphylaxis. You got me? Look at this, because it'll tell you the functions of B cells and T cells. This is <coughs> um, my video. It's like my little pony. Watch. And then you have anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock. I explained that. Please look at those, will you? For real? All right. And then uh, we'll leave it there. We'll finish up. Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. Don't do that. One more. And a CBC with a differential, left shift and right shift. This is like the worst video I ever made. And it's got the most views. I, it's so bad. It's not a good video at all. I think it's got like 7,000 people. Oh, 11,000. Man. <coughs> I got 81 likes. Three dislikes. <laughs> Okay, will you do that for me, please? Guys, there's a question on the final. What is a CBC with a differential? And what is a left shift and a right shift? Watch. CBC with a differential, left shift and right shift. Don't look at that. It'll only give you the answers. So yeah, ambulate. <laughs>